Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to, to start by showing a slide that many of you will have seen before. It's, it, it's basically a price graph of, of crude oil, right? That's something that everybody in this room will have seen. And after a period, a rather stagnant period uh, from 2012 or 2011 to 2013-14, where we had oil prices very consistently at $110 a barrel. OPEC was happy, producers were happy, refiners not quite so happy. Of course, since then we saw a dramatic slowdown after the OPEC 2014 decision not to cut supply, and then we saw a major price drop. It was on the way already, but come November it really crashed down. And it's no surprise that since that fall in oil prices, these bars here represent the surplus of crude oil in the market. Now, that surplus of crude oil is, of course, going into storage, or it has been going into storage very significantly. That makes a lot of sense. That's the contango market, the opposite of the backwardation. Backwardation, of course, is the... The, the, the name that we give the, the, the market situation where prices are higher at the prompt end than, at, than further out. It's that hand-to-mouth existence that, people will, that, that shows good demand. However, you can see here from the surplus that simply too much oil was being produced for the markets. And that largely has come from the US, but indeed other countries are involved as well. And as I mentioned, the refiners are, are happy, and, uh, and, and so the market has changed in quite a dramatic way over the last year and a half, certainly since we were here uh, around this, this time last year. So one of the market um, fa sort of factors at the moment, one of the main ones, is volatility. Volatility has returned to the market, and this is something that is, has... Greatly, is a, is a, a, a large change from a few years ago. As I mentioned, we had very stable oil prices for three years in a row. Dated Brent, the international benchmark, was level at $110 on average for three years in a row. And that actually stopped certain banks and trading companies from even being involved in oil as a commodity, or indeed commodities generally. It's, uh, that, that th traders thrive on volatility. And if there's no volatility, then th there's no money in flat markets, is what they will tell you. Now, since then here we have a few, uh, a few different things. We're looking at dated Brent, at uh, China uh, iron ore prices, and indeed LNG uh, in the Japan-Korea uh, area. And you can see that volatility here on this uh, five-day uh, average basis it has increased hugely, particularly in, in the iron sector. And that means that, obviously, that, that we have yet to find that stability in the market. The equilibrium has been greatly disturbed by supply and demand, um, and, and those two things are the only things that drive price. You know, if, if I ask my reporters, why did the price go up? And they say, oh, because this company bid for it, or this company offered it, and so it went down. If that's never the case. It's about supply and demand, and those are the only two things that will ever drive price. Now, you can see that the physical markets, as reported by Platt in the market on close, continue to grow. We've had um, more deals going through our process, and these are uh, physical barrels reported to us uh, and used in our, pricing assess our price assessment process. And here you can see as many as nearly 130 million barrels over, over the month uh, reported to us, and the, the trend is still strong. There is still a great demand for pricing out there, and I'm glad to say that Platts is at the forefront of that. But we've seen markets really grasp, grasping that physical. They're trying desperately to get hold of barrels, of course, um, despite the contango in the market. But indeed, some of this buying is for storage. Uh, it makes natural sense at the moment, given market structure, where the price is cheaper now than it is further out, to buy now for storage. And we've seen a lot of uh, of buying for the Chinese strategic reserve, uh, a lot of physical demand from China. Obviously, the refiners are, are, are in China have been very busy as well with the lower price of the feedstock, in their, case, uh, in their case crude oil, of course. And we haven't seen a particular slowdown in production. That might be on the way, but of course the main story here is the US increase of production over the last five years or so. Naturally, the shale plays in the, in the Permian Basin, Eagle Ford, Backham, these big names, has had a huge impact on the, on the price of crude oil and indeed the amount of oil going into storage. Now, Russia 
is basically at a fairly flat line. Russia produces pretty much, in my opinion, as much crude oil as it can all the time. And as a result, it's a fairly flat. There's no huge growth uh, in Russian crude oil production. Uh, where it goes is changing, and we'll be covering that later. But the level of production hasn't particularly changed. And Saudi Arabia, of course, has that sort of swing position. They're able to increase and decrease at will. They probably have around about one or two million barrels they could go up or down, depending on their agenda. Now, of course, the meeting in Doha, where, where the Russian ministers met with, uh, with OPEC, uh, ended in a, uh, a failure to agree anything, mainly because of the Iranian-Saudi situation, something, again, that we can discuss later. But he, despite that lack of agreement to cut, um, pr uh, to have a production ceiling, uh, we have seen oil prices increase since then. And part of that is, to an extent, due to the uh, reduced production from the US. And finally, we're seeing the US slowing down. Now, the growth uh, situation, if I can uh, get this to move on, there we go. Here we have the largest growth in oil production over the last few years. And you can see quite clearly that United States, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and Canada, they have all exhibited a growth in their oil production in 2015. That's last year. However, the outlook, as I mentioned, for the US and indeed for certain other countries is, is actually to, for, it, for it to fall. A lot of people, I think, include mainly OPEC, or particularly Saudi Arabia, expected the US production to fall a lot sooner than it did. And that's kind of why we're, we're at where we, we are at where we are today. By not cutting production over the last few years, Saudi Arabia particularly, but indeed other uh, OPEC members, expected the lower oil prices to knock out some of that new uh, shale production, some of the, the tight oil production that has led to such a large increase in the US oil production. Now, by taking them on head-on for market share, Saudi Arabia has clearly lost that battle, I would say, when you consider that the US production hasn't slowed down until now. We, there, there are various reports on the, the level of production change uh, from the U.S. over the next year or so. Um, they range from 600,000 barrels a day up to 1.8 million barrels a day. It depends who you read. A million barrels a day seems roundabout fair, maybe 800,000, something like that. But either way, that is oil that will be taken out of the market. It's oil that won't be going into reserves, and it's oil that won't be refined. As a result, you can expect perhaps... Uh, a, a rebalancing of the supply and demand um, equilibrium. Now, of course, Iraq uh, has had a great deal of, um, of changes and a lot of uh, trouble with production as well. But um, Iran is a very interesting story, and that's one that we're going to be focusing on in the next session uh, when we see how Iran is fighting for market share now that sanctions have, have been lifted to a large extent and it's competing with Russian crude oil in the export markets as well. Now, turning to Iran, we see, we see a large amount of um, uh, oil from Iran going to China and India. They weren't really uh, impacted by the sanctions anyway, so they continued to buy. But the European countries and the US, of course, which isn't a big buyer of Iranian oil at the moment, they have started to come back to that market, and we're seeing a lot of sour, slightly heavy uh, oil being, being put into the market. And, of course, that does compete with Ural's crude oil or Rebco. Now, Iran has been working very hard to try to um, reconnect with the market. They've already done some deals, some term deals with Italian refiners, with Greek refiners, uh, and they're looking for new alternative markets as well. And you can see that the, the main markets in uh, January to November last year were indeed those Asian countries not uh, affected by the sanctions. The European countries, of course, knocked out Turkey, Italy, Spain, and Greece those would be the target markets for Iran going forward. And, of course, you know, if, you're selling, uh, if you've been selling oil to those countries over the last few years while Iran has been uh, forbidden in those part, that part of the world, then, of course, you can expect to see increased competition. Now, I mentioned the, um, the, the, the slowdown in price or the fall in price. Now, of course, along with that comes a certain amount of cost balancing. The industry has entered cost-saving mode. We've seen Saudi Arabia 
changing their financing. There's an IPO, you know, they're, they're issuing shares for Saudi Aramco, essentially. They're selling off parts of the oil industry to raise cash. Now, with a, a, a market like, such as um, Saudi Arabia that's so devoted to oil, of course, if the oil price falls, they will suffer. And so now we're seeing new and more, <coughs> excuse me, more inventive uh, processes coming into the Saudi Arabian thinking. Um, oil services companies, this is, uh, I've, I've put Schlumberger and Halliburton up there. They're just two examples, of course, but losing 34,000 and 22,000 jobs in, the, in that crucial um, oil services sector. That's the drilling, the pipelines, the logistics. That, of course, speaks of a large uh, fall in the fortunes of the oil companies. We're seeing investment falling from, uh, from various companies, and indeed, you can see there, BP has had to uh, lay off 4,000 jobs as well. So, you know, it, against all of this, it's no surprise that we've seen uh, the, the, these things happen while oil prices have fallen. And so if they remain low, I don't expect to see any, any change in those fortunes for those companies. And so, of course, it's a, a contagion that has spread. Now, I mentioned the US being a, a major part of this. Here we can see the, some of the major fields, and you can see the rig count. Now, the rig count is traditionally a very important measure of production for, of a certain country, particularly in the, in the US. But let's not forget, a lot of the oil rigs in the US are very small. They're, they're very compact, they're quite mobile, they're mostly onshore, well, a lot of them are onshore. And we've seen a, a lot of sort of almost family industries in their back garden, um, you know, drilling oil. And there's a, there's a big difference between oil, uh, oil in the US and oil in other parts of the world. You know, if you own the land, then the oil beneath your land is yours to an extent, right? Whereas we don't have that in many other parts of the world. And that has created a huge amount of, uh, of innovation among those who have access to the land and access to this new technology that has, has taken over the US uh, oil world. Now, the cost savings as part of that technology, I know that uh, my colleague Pete will be talking about this on the gas side as well later on. The cost savings have been so remarkable that the production hasn't fallen, as, as, as I've already mentioned. And despite the fact that the, the rig count has dropped significantly in the Permian and Eagle Ford areas and the Bakken as well, the rig count is down now from a high of around about 1,900, 1,800 oil rigs down to about 400 now. But production hasn't significantly slowed. Yes, it is finally slowing at last. We're seeing people um, unable to make so much money. And here we can see the kind of recoveries that you can make at certain prices. This blue price here is $40 plus. And this is the recovery rate at $30, uh, $30 and then at $20. And so you can see that the recovery rate for the higher prices, of course, is far higher. But when you start reaching $20, then that's when people are going to start dropping out of the market. And we did see some of that to an extent, to an extent. However, it has proved very resilient, although we're now seeing, seeing the tide turn on US production, at least in the crude oil side. So here's the, um, from the EIA, here's the uh, production uh, prediction from the US. And you can see that the, the, rise of, the rise of crude oil production over the last few years uh, we're now around about here, and you expect to see uh, it falling around about 600,000 barrels. That was the EIA's prediction, although yesterday in the newspapers I saw uh, around about 1.5 million. So it's anyone's guess. But either way, that's got a large amount of supply being taken out of the market. And, of course, that means that they're going to have to buy from somewhere else if demand remains the same. Again, I would expect that contango to shallow. I would expect uh, as if demand stays the same and supply is cut, you don't need to be an economist to know that things will change and prices will go up. So I could expect to see that. And I think we've seen some of that already. I think that the, here we have, um, you know, in 2014, there was uh, US crude oil production rose by 16%. That's a huge amount. And we're still seeing around about 8% growth, or we have been seeing about 8% growth, which sounds great to many countries. 8% growth would be wonderful in GDP. It would be wonderful in many different economic uh, measures. Uh, however, it's slower than it has been, of course. Now, that, that message from the US is sending a, generally a, a bearish message, you can imagine. However, something very important happened, and John T is going to cover this in a moment as well, is that the US market changed to be an export market. 
Now, this was probably the biggest oil news that came out of the, the, the last year for me. Of course, there was an OPEC meeting that failed. There's been some, some interesting cuts in, in expenditure here and there. But the US, before Obama leaves the administration, uh, for him to get that through is a remarkable change. The US has always guarded its production very jealously. Energy security, of course, since the big price shocks of the 1970s, is intensely important to the US. But for them to be able to um, capitalize on an international market that needs more oil uh, when they've been producing so much more oil is a very innovative step for a country that has guarded its production so closely. As a result, we have seen a rebalancing of the global oil picture. We now, we now have three internationally traded benchmarks that can really prove market value. And that, the, the, the spreads between not only Brent TI or, or Brent and Dubai, the two really important ones, uh, are, are there for everyone to see. But now we see WTI and Dubai. We see uh, w, WTI and you know, competing with, with other grades in the, in, in the um, Atlantic Basin. And there is an opportunity now for the U.S. to to, to export mark, to export crude crude oil and also have a uh, have a benchmark that properly reflects international trade. For many years, people said that the WTI contract was a, a broken benchmark. It's a, it's representative of a. Uh, of something that can't trade externally. U.S. crude oil wouldn't be exported. And all it was doing was reflecting the price of U.S. oil for delivery at Cushing, Oklahoma. Now, that's not a broken benchmark. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. It was just designed to assess the price of crude oil for delivery at Cushing. However, without the export market and the pipelines being able to remove that oil from the market, of course, it doesn't share the dynamics of a more internationally traded crude oil. Now, however, it does. And we're seeing U.S. crude oil being delivered into Italy. You know, some of the, the, I think people were probably quite keen to, do, to be famous for doing the first trade. And so we saw some trades that were probably not economic, really. But we're seeing trades occurring. And we're now seeing the U.S. Being, uh, falling into, the, into Japan's top 10 suppliers. Now, that's something that you wouldn't have expected a year ago. And if Japan is buying it, then potentially U.S. oil is maybe even a, a is competition for ESPO these days. There's something to think about, something that we certainly wouldn't have expected too long ago. So the supply and demand, demand balance has certainly changed uh, in recent years. We've seen OPEC not agreeing. We've seen uh, Iran coming back. We see uh, growth of demand slowing. Of course, growth in supply is potentially slowing as well, hence that $50 price these days when it was $30 uh, only a few months ago. But here we can see demand growth falling uh, by 600,000 barrels. And there is the de demand growth, not quite flatlining, but certainly slowing down. We're seeing a rebalancing of that supply-demand situation. So demand is falling, but indeed supply is falling as well. So I'm not saying that we're going to see a racing high price, and indeed nobody really thought it was going to be above $75 uh, this time next year. But there is certainly a, a rebalancing between that supply and demand picture. And as you can see, there we go. Sour crude is, is on the up. And also, uh, my Russian isn't very good there. I can't actually read what that says. Oh, yes, yeah, so the carry structure. That's right. Three billion, three billion barrels of, of, of crude oil in, uh, in storage shows that it's a market that has been oversupplied. Now... If we look at the, the things that are um, currently... Oh, I've lost my... My words have disappeared from my slide there. But that's what's on the demand side, on the supply side. OK, well, there should be some words there. When we send you the slides, we'll have a look. But basically, the supply and demand balance is governed by uh, Iran coming back on the, on the long side, uh, but the US, uh, come, the US uh, dem uh, supply falling on the, uh, on the supply side. We're also seeing um, OPEC not cutting, of course. Indeed, US exports. Oh, well, that one stayed there. US exports is maybe the balancing factor. That's one of the... Uh, I think the US exports is a swing factor, a bit like Saudi, um, Saudi production, that can go either way. It now has the ability to... Uh, to swing both ways, and that, that is, I think, is very, very useful in such a dynamic market as oil. So, as we see, um, we have, in the demand outlook, we see uh, demand is generally weaker in crude. 
Um, in gasoline, in the products world, gasoline has really come back as well, and that's something that's very important. The U.S. consumer has come back, uh, and what does the U.S. consumer like? They like gasoline. I've said it before, you know, if you go to Houston or if you go anywhere in the U.S., they talk about gasoline prices like British people talk about the weather. You know, if you get two people in a room together from Britain, they always talk about the weather. I don't know what it is here in Russia, but uh, we, everyone has an equivalent. Uh, in the U.S., they talk about gasoline prices, and it's, it's a very intense conversation very often, and a very competitive one. But here we've seen that the, the future of e uh, EMEA diesel production uh, depends on a huge amount of exports that's coming in. I'm going to cover that in a moment. And we can see that supply, not demand, actually holds the key to higher prices in the near future. Now, I'm going to hand over to John T. fairly soon, but before I do, I just want to go quickly through Asia and some of the supply and demand growth that we're seeing there. Asia has really been the big area of demand change. And of course, Russia has known this. Russia has built the ESPO pipeline, and, and things are increasingly heading east. Naturally, that is the growth area. We've seen China growing for years and years, of course. The, the double-digit growth of GDP may have gone, but it's still a good place to send oil, of course. And we see China competing with just about everybody when it comes to oil, as I mentioned, they're filling the strategic reserves, and so naturally, you might expect to see that. Um, Japan, well, Japanese demand has fallen despite the Asian increase. Of course, the Japanese economy has been suffering in recent years since Fukushima, maybe even slightly before the Fukushima disaster. Um, however, it does remain an important uh, bellwether in, in certain parts of the world. And as I mentioned, it, it, it is seeing uh, demand from, from the US now. We're seeing supply from the US going into there as well. I'm just going to go quite quickly through this. And Jonti has lots to say. Another interesting thing is since the, uh, since the US has been able to export crude oil, and since the refinery upgrades in Russia and the refinery upgrades in certain parts of Saudi Arabia, we're seeing a normalization, a kind of equilibrium, if you will, between various regions and their margins that they're able to get on their crude oil. We're seeing, uh, here we have um, Arab light. We've just chosen a, a, a grade. And here's the cracking margin for Arab light in various regions. Singapore is the medium blue. Italy, Augusta, down there in the Mediterranean is the, the, the black one. And the US up here, the US Gulf Coast, is the light blue. Now, as you can see, the, those, the refining margins seem to be something more of a par at the moment. So we're able to see very clearly that a lot of, a lot of the market has a lot of choice in the barrel it can, it can choose and the barrel it can run. And they're all making around about the same money for their for their choice of crude. Now, with the amount of crude available, that's actually a very useful thing. And the margins that we saw last year, particularly in Europe, are unlikely to be repeated this year. I would find it very surprising if we're able to recapture those margins that refiners saw last year in Europe. Here we can see huge margins for Basra Light and, the other, and other sour grades, um, and, and Brass River from, from Nigeria, 40s Urals. Again, same thing here. This is in the Mediterranean, and this is in Northwest Europe. And you can see that the, this period of, of uh, late summer last year was a time when the refiners finally had something to celebrate in Europe. You know, refineries in Europe have been closing down. They've been turned into storage facilities. There have been union disputes from the workers as they try to shut them down. But there's, there, there's no need for a lot of these refineries now. We're seeing huge growth from the Middle East. We're seeing India supplying uh, Europe with oil. And of course, Russia, the Russian refinery upgrades, which we'll talk about later, they have seen a huge amount of middle distillates like diesel coming to the market now, as opposed to the, the typical supply from within Europe. So last year, well, this year, actually, in February, there was a um, we had the IP week in London, the big oil week, where all the traders and producers get together in London. And the only people who still had really big lavish parties with the, with the dancing girls and the singers and the, and the caviar, generally, was either a couple of national oil companies who were trying to put on a brave face um, from certain former Soviet countries, not Russia. And there was also the storage companies, and the refiners. Finally, there was some money in it for the refiners. 
And I think that last year's oil price, and indeed this year's oil price to an extent, has been a, um, a stay of execution for, for several refiners. Now, things might change because there is maintenance. Uh, maintenance is required on a lot of these units. And, and this is maintenance that many of the refiners delayed because margins were so good. So there might be a bit of a change in the, in, in the coming months, but we'll have to wait and see. And similarly, as you can see, the, the, the falling prices of crude oil has led to a larger throughput across all of the European countries, certainly. We've seen higher throughputs in, in Italy and Germany and France and, uh, and the Netherlands and so on. Now, something underpinning, before I hand over to John T, something that's, uh, that's underpinning all of this is gasoline demand. Gasoline used to be king of the barrel, we called it. It was the one that we would export to the US it was the one that uh, would get drawn sometimes to Asia from Europe as well. And a lot of uh, the, we, we, in, in Europe, we're very long diesel. A lot of our refineries are set up to make diesel, jet fuel, middle distillates. Now, the US, of course, has been producing a lot of light, sweet crude that's quite easy to turn into gasoline. And so that pull hasn't been quite so large. And diesel has, has now, well, had taken on the name of king of the barrel. Diesel was the big thing. Now, however, we've seen a shortage of octane components. We've seen the U.S. coming back into the driving market significantly. And gasoline is now the king again. And that's been underpinning a lot of the refinery demand. And simply, you can see that the U.S. driver is driving more miles. There's more money in the economy over there. They've, they've started buying the larger SUVs again because the price has been low. So when, when oil prices are low, it's a very simplistic statistic, but when oil prices are low, Americans buy bigger cars. It really is that simple. And as a result, we're seeing them drive, they're driving more and more miles. This is number of miles driven. Um, how they do these statistics, I'm not entirely sure, but this comes from the US. And you can see that the US is driving more. Now, there might be competition, of course, from electric cars. People keep talking about electric cars. I don't think I've ever seen an electric car in Russia. Um, I would like to. Um, they are, however, they're expensive, the large ones, and they, they have problems with the batteries. And as such, they, there isn't quite the same market adoption for electric cars around the world as the original designers would have hoped. However, I, a report in the Wall Street Journal yesterday was saying that uh, within 15 years, would they expect to see electric cars reducing um, gasoline usage in the US by 5%. That's a significant amount, and that's quite a large amount if you consider how much gasoline the US burns every year. 5% down due to electric cars? That's a heck of a prediction. I'd like to see if that actually happens. And as a result, you can see that the, uh, the, the price of, of gasoline uh, and the, uh, the, the usage of gasoline, rather, has increased. This is 2015 and 2013. Again, there's that peak over summer, the US driving season. So that's a seasonal thing you'll always expect to see. But you can see that, again, due to the economy, due to the huge amount of oil out there, we are seeing big changes in gasoline. The other big change in the other direction is how diesel has started to see a downturn. Here's an interesting statistic from, uh, from Europe. This is the registration of new cars, and we can see that diesel cars are losing favor among many countries where diesel cars were once very, very popular. France almost exclusively uses diesel. In fact, 60% uh, of the cars in, in France are diesel, and they last year saw a fall of around about 6% in diesel registrations. Now, that gives us the impression that diesel it has obviously had a lot of bad press, Many of you in the room will remember the Volkswagen scandal of uh, late last year, October last year, I think. Um, and indeed, we're seeing now that diesel is, uh, is full of more toxins and particulates and CO2 than people were originally saying. And as such, we're not seeing so much diesel being used. Now, just before I finish, the, um, uh, another major factor is the, the, the dieselization of Europe, which happened so long ago, has now been met with a huge amount of supply from around the world. Um, here we have the imports into Europe only. And you can see Russia is the blue line here, uh, the USA up here, and here's Saudi Arabia growing as well. So you can see that diesel imports into Europe continue 
uh, in the same way as they do from, on jet fuel from India, from Kuwait. Huge amount of middle distillates pointing into Europe, and you can see why it's hard for European refiners to compete with that. Um, but we're seeing the US increasing.